If we think about the workers in the parable who were hired first, who do they relate to? Maybe to the Jews in the new kingdom of God. Is Jesus saying that the Jews who came into God's kingdom first, the disciples and all the other followers of Jesus, were not to consider themselves superior to the Gentiles when they also joined the kingdom? Or, as William Barclay suggests in his commentary, is he talking to us and saying that those of us who've been in the church for a very long time must not consider ourselves superior to people who've come to faith more recently or later in life? And we who've been in the church for ages do not have the right to dictate the policy or to resent intrusion of new generations with new ideas and different ways. Simon Coupland, a historian and church minister, tells a story of a pastor in America who preached for 11 years with a man sitting with his fingers in his ears in the congregation. It was because the church committee had decided to put in a new sound system. The man had opposed this decision, but they went ahead with it anyway. So he sat in church every week for 11 years with his fingers in his ears to show his disapproval. I'm not sure what happened after the 11 years, whether he died or left or whether the vicar left. I'm not sure. (laughs) Now, I'm not suggesting that there's anybody in our church like that. (laughs) But let's make sure that we don't become embittered if ever the PCC or the ROC team make decisions that we don't agree with. It's fine to disagree and have a discussion, but it's not good to hold a grudge and become bitter because that puts a block not only between ourselves and whoever we've had a disagreement with, but also between us and God. Because Jesus said, we have to forgive other people so that God will forgive us. People in church circles, and perhaps particularly in church leadership circles, can easily assume that they are the special ones. God's inner circle, the top table. But in reality... God is out in the marketplace looking for the people that everyone else tried to ignore and welcoming them in on the same terms with his generous grace. By the way, grace, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, means, please can we have the, oh, thank you, yeah, <laughs> the spontaneous, unmerited gift of the divine favour in the salvation of sinners and the divine influence operating in individuals for for their regeneration and sanctification. It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? So it's the undeserved, unwarranted, unearned, unjustified gift of God to us of salvation, of us being saved, and of new life. That's what regeneration is. And Sanctification means being made holy. So it's the undeserved gift of God to us of salvation and being made holy and of new life. We cannot earn what God gives. We cannot deserve it. It's not pay or a reward, but a gift. God's gift of grace is eternal life. Mercy is not getting the punishment we deserve. Grace is getting the blessing we don't deserve, the blessing of eternal life with him. It's important for us to remember that, as William Barclay puts it, whether a person enters the kingdom in the first flush of youth, the strength of midday, or when the shadows are lengthening, they are equally loved by God. In the world, we are generally rewarded for our efforts. 
not always, but generally. Non-achievers tend to be looked down on. But with God, things are different. You see, we do not and cannot ever earn a right to enter the kingdom of God. None of us is good enough to earn that right. And God doesn't love us in proportion to how much we've done to please him. We might serve God in all that we do. We might have served God for years, struggling on in good times and through the scorching heat of our days. This does not buy God's love and approval. God loves us. He loves you completely and utterly. Whether you know it or not, and whether we think we're serving God or not. We are not loved more because we work hard, and we are not loved less when we struggle, or want to give up, or break down. We are loved completely, utterly, and always. Even death cannot separate us from the love of God. The sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross was for everyone, everywhere, in all circumstances. The main problem for the early workers in the parable was that they expected to be paid more. Their expectation wasn't based on a promise, but on an assumption. I do have some sympathy with them. It seems logical that those who'd worked a 12-hour day might receive more than those who'd only worked for a few hours or even only one hour. But God's logic is not necessarily the same as ours. God looks at things that we don't think about, and he may not be so concerned with the things that bother us. The first employees in the parable came to an arrangement with the landowner. They wanted to make sure they were paid fairly for their day's work, and they had a contract. But for those hired later, all they wanted was a chance to work, and they left, willingly left the reward to the landowner. When we have unwarranted expectations, we can feel cheated when they're not met. But our resulting anger will be unjustified because we shouldn't have had the unwarranted expectation in the first place. In the Christian life, the first concern is not pay. Christians work for the joy of serving God and other people. That's why vicars aren't paid very much. So let's think a bit more about God's justice. Jonah got really cross with God because God changed his mind and didn't destroy Nineveh. Why was Jonah cross? Was it because he was concerned about his reputation? He had pronounced that Nineveh was going to be destroyed, and now it wasn't going to be. Will anybody believe anything he says again? But what Jonah wasn't thinking about was that 120,000 people who didn't know their left hand from their right, and the innocent animals. It's good to know that God cares about animals too, isn't it? The people had repented, seriously repented, with fasting and dressed in sackcloth. Jonah must have been quite a gifted preacher to achieve that sort of result. The thing is, when God showed unreasonable grace and blessing to Jonah by rescuing him from being thrown overboard in the first chapter of Jonah, Jonah was very happy, well, quite happy, 
But when God shows unreasonable grace and blessings to the people of Nineveh, Jonah is not so happy. Is this rational? In the parable, the workers who were hired first were not thinking about the children of the later recruited workers who would now be able to eat instead of having to go hungry, or the self-esteem of the people who'd been waiting all day to be hired. God chooses to have mercy on people like that. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. That man had done nothing to earn his forgiveness other than turn to Jesus, acknowledge his lordship, and admit his own need of forgiveness. If God wants to do that, who are we to be like the older brother in the story of the prodigal son and resent God's mercy and grace to other people? We don't deserve God's grace and mercy either. God has said in Exodus 33 verse 19, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. In John 21, verse 21, Peter was walking with Jesus when he noticed John following them. And he said to Jesus, what about him? And Jesus said, in effect, never you mind about him, you follow me. So it's not up to us to worry about the compassion and mercy God shows to other people. It's up to us to follow him and do what he asks us to do, which is to love God with all that we are and to love each other and our neighbours as ourselves. So what have we learned from all this? Firstly, God is just. He is the God of justice. But life is not always fair. We live in a world of sin and suffering. Bad things happen to good people, but God is still good. If God was fair with all of us, none of us would receive eternal life. God seeks to save people. Remember, it was the landowner in the parable, who went out looking for laborers and kept on going back to look for more of them. Secondly, God shows us unreasonable grace. And he gives us the gift of being put right with him through the death and resurrection of Jesus, if we choose to accept it. God loves us, not because we earn it by doing good things, but because he is the God of love. Nothing we can do will make him love us more, and nothing we can do will make him love us less. Thirdly, what God wants most is for all the other people who don't know him yet to receive his free gift of salvation too. And what he would really like is for us to work with him to help them to find out about it and to welcome them into the family of God without any reservation or prejudice.